Signal Broadcasting Company presents Eyes Aloft. Army Flash. One. Single. Low. Seam. Eight. Earnest. Four. Overhead. Wet. Eyes aloft. Watch in the sky. Watching for planes flying the lanes up above. Eyes aloft. Eyes aloft. The fourth fighter command of the United States Army Air Forces in cooperation with West Coast radio stations, dedicates this official weekly radio program to the 150,000 volunteer civilian filter center workers and ground observers whose round-the-clock vigilance keeps watchful guard of the Pacific coast against attack by enemy planes. Eyes along, night and day, will help protect the U.S. This is Ken Carpenter speaking. Tonight, the 24th gala performance of Eyes Law. We'll announce the winner of this week's Why Do I Come Here contest. You'll hear the Gordon Jenkins Orchestra and the Hollywoodman. Sam Hayes, outstanding radio newscaster, has gathered another edition of Filter Center News. By request, we repeat the performance of the dramatic narrative, the recognition, the thoughts of an American soldier who imagines he meets Christ on a battlefield. Also, another prize-winning great American story and the presentation of the handsome Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy. Now we turn the program over to your popular narrator, Jane Whitman. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? First, we wish to present the 100-word entry that won this week's Why Do I Come Here contest. A weekly prize, a Treasury Department war saving stamp book with $5 worth of war stamps goes to the winner. Also, his or her observation post or filter center receives a handsome desk clock as a prize. Gordon Jenkins composes an original musical score to background the dramatization of each winning story. And now, we present this week's winner in our new contest, Why Do I Come Here? Why Do I Come Here? This week's winner, Mr. Carl E. Hofer, Chief Observer, Tustin Post, Route 1, Box 345, Santa Ana, California. And this is Carl Hofer's winning entry. Why do I come here? Well, mister, this is war. That means that thousands of the finest kids in all the world are out there dying that America may live. It means that more thousands will come home badly mutilated, permanently and totally disabled. It means that there must be a free and benevolent America, then, to take care of those men so they may know their suffering was not in vain. Would that I might don the uniform again and be one of them. But Fritz's machine guns plus Father Time settled that for me long ago. But, mister, the Aircraft Warning Service is a unit of the United States Army. And when I'm turning my eyes aloft, on the graveyard shift, I'm soldiering again and helping save our America. Why do I come here? How could I stay away? Congratulations, Mr. Carl E. Hofer of Santa Ana, California. Your prize of $5 worth of war stamps has been mailed to you. Also... You have won for your Tustin Observation Post a handsome clock. Because of the many excellent entries, we wish to give honorable mention to the following three contributors. Books with $1 worth of war saving stamps have been forwarded as honorable mention prizes to Mrs. Winifred McDonald, RFD 3, Box 226, Shelton, Washington. Charles R. White, 708 Virginia Street, San Bernardino, California. And Lucille Lee, Box 148, Bellingham, Washington. The statements are judged on the basis of originality and sincerity. Decision of the judges is final. Duplicate prizes will be awarded in the case of tie. Congratulations, all. And now, those civilian volunteers of the Aircraft Warning Service who wish to contribute a 100-word entry to next week's Why Do I Come Here contest, please send your entry to Eyes Aloft, Hollywood, California. Merely state why you continue to faithfully serve the Aircraft Warning Service. 
Maybe you will be one of next week's winners. On our first broadcast of 1943, we presented a stirring dramatic narrative entitled The Recognition. It was written by the well-known Portland, Oregon attorney, C.W. Robinson. So many, many letters have come to us, still come, asking for copies of the selection. We now have Mr. Robinson's permission to offer to you, free of charge, a mimeographed copy of The Recognition. In answer to many other requests, we repeat the performance of this thrilling piece of writing. It speaks the thoughts of an American soldier far from home. The thoughts of some American boy in khaki on sentry duty on a lonely night. The Recognition. I think I'd know him if I'd meet him trudging down some snow-filled Russian road, or if we'd stopped a while beneath the burning Libyan sun. Yeah, I'd know him if I was resting in the jungle heat in a valley near a town called Guna. I kind of feel I'd know him anywhere or anytime. And when I'd meet him, we'd rest a while. He'd sit down by me, and I'd lay down my Tommy gun and gas mask and my pack, and we'd just talk about the things he'd want to hear. I'd tell him of my mom, how she believed in him. He'd smile and say, my mother too. Mothers, they've always been the same. Then I'd tell him how I grew up, how I was raised on the streets where the men and not the houses wear the numbers. I'd tell him how when my old man got hitched again, they threw me out. That's how I got to running with the gang. And then I'd tell him how when I got a little older, I got in the racket. And he'd look at me and say, There are scars on your soul, my son. Then he'd look at his white hands with those great scars upon the palms. And it would seem to me as if the wounds were fresh again. Yet when he would lay his hand upon my shoulder, why the touch would make me clean again. Then I'd tell him of the things just as they are. I'd tell him of this guy, Shickle Grover, and that bald-headed fat one that plays Caesar. I'd tell him what they did. I'd tell him how they murdered millions of men and women and... Yeah, and little children. I'd tell him that they mocked at him and laughed at God. And I'd see his eyes flash. And I'd feel kind of sorry that I bothered him. He'd seem to know it. For he'd say, Verily I say unto you, It shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for such men as these. Well, maybe then I'd say, But how about me? Me and my Tommy gun. And he'd say to me earnest like, I say unto you, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. Then, about that time, we'd have some grub. I'd take out my emergency rations and we'd split them and we'd eat. I'd maybe have to say, I'm sorry, but I ain't got any more and my canteen's dry. He'd nod and say, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And then I'd feel just like once when I was tired and I lay down under my belly at a brook and drank and felt so cool and fine again. Then I'd look to where he was and I'd be alone. Alone again. Yeah, this much I've got. This present on this night of 1943. This thing I've got for sure, I know. I'd know him if I'd meet him on the Russian steppe, or on the Libyan waste, or in a steaming jungle near a town called Goda. I'd 
I'd know him anywhere, anytime, or any place. of our fighting men in God, in country, and in home. Yes, their divine faith in you, in those of us left at home to carry on. And we must carry on in every way we can that they shall not fight in vain. Next night you go to serve on your observation post, look up for a moment at a star and think. Think of some boy away from home on a desert waste or in a steaming jungle. He may be looking at that same star, too, and saying a silent prayer of hope and faith. Both he and you will be serving your nation under the light of that self-same twinkling star. If you would like a mimeographed copy of C.W. Robinson's The Recognition, free of charge, address your request to Eyes Aloft, Hollywood. And now here's Gordon Jenkins as orchestra and the Hollywoodman to bring you an exciting new arrangement of Marching Along Together. Hit it, Gordy. Center News, compiled, edited, and presented each week for the 4th Fighter Command by the noted newscaster, Sam Hayes. He's ready to go to press now with the third edition of Filter Center News, presenting Sam Hayes. And uh, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Sam Hayes, your eyes aloft reporter, bringing you personal news of Pacific Coast Filter Center workers from border to border. Seattle, Washington, the last week's minor blizzard closed schools, stores, and even war industries in this area. Women of the Seattle Filter Center kept on the job. No transportation caused Marion Shaw to walk 43 blocks to duty. Ruth Stye, 33 blocks. And Irene Merkley made a round-trip, four-mile walk to the center. During the five-day emergency, absences were less than average. Redding, California. Military and civilian members of the Redding Filter Center deeply sympathized with the family of Miss Charlotte Lambert, one of the installation's most willing and efficient workers. Though Private First Class Rinke, Corporal Montez, Technical Sergeant Hulinger, and Private Attard gave transfusions, Miss Lambert passed away January 19th. She was 24 years old. San Francisco, Operations Room Shift 8 gave a surprise birthday treat to Viola K. Sykes. Portland, Oregon, wedding bells. Bertel Dubaivers, volunteer on shift 18 at the Information Center, was married Thursday, January 21st, to Mr. Leonard Schloss. Bellingham, Washington, Marie Ordahl, filter center volunteer and a teacher at the Whatcom High School, is back from a visit to San Francisco. We wonder what the attraction was besides the sunshine. 
North San Francisco Filter Center. Dorothy Sutton, while faithfully attending Ship 9, has also achieved the right to wear two white stripes on her Red Cross Volunteer Nurses Aid uniform, signifying over 500 hours service. San Diego. Mrs. Virginia Sims of Teams 2A, 2C, and 6D is recuperating from pneumonia. A speedy recovery is wished by the military and volunteer personnel of the San Diego Filter Center. Bakersfield. Unable to be at work on the filter board on account of a slight illness, Mrs. G.E. Sniffen continued to serve by sending several pies to the volunteers' canteen. And were they good? Boy. Fresno, California, Mrs. Alberta Duffy of the 5th Night Team not only works for the Aircraft Warning Service, but is employed by the Army as a truck dispatcher at Basic Training Center No. 8. Eugene, Oregon. Stork work. Mrs. Edith Groshong, popular switchboard operator on Section 9 at the Eugene Filter Center, expects to start about March 1st. Sacramento, Lynn Harris of the Sacramento Filter Center has just announced her engagement to Lieutenant K.R. Smith of the Army Air Corps. The wedding will take place in Abilene, Texas in February. And thus we conclude tonight's Filter Center news with this week's nomination to the honor roll of service. This week, we name Mrs. Florence Henriksen, volunteer of the Portland Filter Center, who in one month served a total of 222 hours. Can anybody beat that record? This is your Eyes Aloft Filter Center news reporter, Sam Hayes, bidding you one and all a very good good evening. An announcement to the women of the Pacific Coast. If you think you can qualify, you too may be able to share the task of helping to operate the Army Air Force's filter centers. If you would care to volunteer your services as a filter center worker, telephone your local civilian defense headquarters for information. Perhaps you can qualify for this fascinating, vital, secretive work. We repeat, for information, merely telephone your local civilian defense headquarters. <laughs> Now, tonight's new and true great American story. Nestled in the hills some 65 miles east of San Diego is the small town of Julian. An observation post was established near the community of Julian. Perhaps few posts have had a more bitter struggle for existence. A short time ago, Mr. James E. Franks, assistant county director of San Diego County, asked volunteers to write a history of the Julian Post. Finally, cheerful, dynamic, industrious Mary Broadborough wrote the following splendid letter addressed to the assistant county director. Dear Jim, you're absolutely, completely insane. You ask me, who can neither spell nor punctuate properly, to write an article about our post. I've never written an article in my life, or anything else that made sense. I don't intend to start now. However, I'll give you the dope, and you can write your own darned article. Here goes. Have you ever heard the east wind... Well, just come up on this post with me, some graveyard shift. It always blows when I'm here. The kind of wind that you have to lean into to stand up straight. But I should worry now. I'm snug inside the only building on the mountain that can keep the wind out. And I know that when the snow flies up here at 4,300 feet elevation, we're really going to appreciate this new post more and more. But to think back, a year ago this month, when our post first organized, and we were located at Pine Hill, some three miles away. We had one of the many cabins at Kruger's Summer Resort, the resort being closed for the winter. Snow was heavy. War had just been declared. It was spooky walking around in that deserted camp and just a bit scary. I remember hearing Annie Grand and Myrtle Bott speak of that very first watch they served up at Pine Hill. Myrtle? Yes, Annie? Are you going to like coming up here, um, nights, I mean? What? I don't know. Well, I, I guess it'll be all right once we get used to the place. It's sort of lonesome and... What was that? What? thought I heard a sound. Oh, I didn't hear anything. My imagination, I guess. What time is it now? Um, 3 a.m. Four minutes after. We well, come to relieve us at 5. I know. I think that maybe... Wait. What? I thought I heard an airplane. I'll open the cabin door. What? It is a plane. Oh, quick. Let me put on my coat and galoshes. Oh, I'll go with you. I wish you would. Did Did you see the plane? No, I can reach these planes and tough until they're right over us here. I know so many trees. There, my, my overshoes. I 
Come on, let's go. Do you know where the phone is over there, Annie? Yes, right inside the main lobby of the hotel building. I have the key to the front door. Oh, I'd feel better if there was a caretaker or somebody living in the hotel up here. Well, we mustn't think about it, Myrtle. Here, come on. Close the door. Keep what heat there is in the cabin. There. It went right overhead. It had one motor. Yes, flying low. Come on. Our post at Pine Hills was in a beautiful setting, but you couldn't see out to look for planes on account of the tall trees. I remember another time, about a month after the post was opened up there at Pine Hills, Dick Farley, who, in spite of a broken leg and against the advice of his friends, insisted upon taking his regular midnight watch. I was on duty that night. My partner and I were supposed to be relieved by Dick at midnight, but he didn't come. Finally, about 2 a.m., we really began to worry about him. I've been thinking, Mary. Maybe Dick tried to drive up here and something happened to his car. Maybe we should go and look. Maybe you're right. Look, you stay here and watch for the planes and make any reports. I'll go. Well, I'll walk out to the road with you. I'll keep within distance of the hotel building and the phone. Oh, I'm so worried about Dick. We shouldn't have let him try to come to the post tonight. Oh, nobody could stop Dick. Oh, wind again. Come on, we'll look for him. I remember we walked down the road less than a quarter of a mile. And there, we found Dick Farley's car off the road, in the ditch, jammed into a snowbank. It's Dick Farley's car, all right. Oh, it's in the ditch. Oh, oh. Hello, girls. Oh, Dick. Dick, are you hurt? Hurt? <laughs> I should say not. Your car is wrecked? Oh, no, I just slid in the snowbank. Can't get it out. I knew somebody would come. Oh. Hey, sorry I'm late. What time is it? Oh, it's a little after two. Now, Dick, what are you doing? Now, don't get out of this car. You think I'm going to sit here and keep on freezing now that i got some help? Here, Mary, would you hold my crutches for me? How's your leg? Okay. Here, <laughs> help me get on these things. Well, one of us can drive you back to town in our car. Nothing doing. I'm going to finish out what's left of my watch tonight. You ladies can go on home as soon as you see me up to the post. I knew I couldn't make it up the hill alone on these crutches. Well, come on, you girls. I can make it to the post now. Farley continued to come to the post there at Pine Hills, even though he had a broken leg and was on crutches. You couldn't stop a fellow like Dick. He's in the army now. I don't know where, but I'll bet he's still got plenty of the same old fighting spirit. The roads were so bad that first winter that we were finally forced to move from Pine Hills to the fire station in town. But the few weeks we were there, the snow plow worked continuously, trundling snow off the main street. You'd think those highway boys would finally get through flying snow. That snow keeps falling. Well, this fire station sure a bum place for an observation post. Yeah. When that snow plow isn't roaring up and down the street, the truck line boys across the way are warming up the diesel. Couldn't hear a plane if we had to. We've got to keep watching the skies every minute. I think as soon as the weather breaks a little, we'll have to move the post back to Pine Hill. Our post seemed destined to misfortunes. But we still kept it running some way. In March, our grand chief observer, Harvey Bassford, a veteran of the last war, moved the post back to Pine Hill. It was a relief to get away from the noisy fire station. Well, you can imagine our dismay when hard-working Harvey Bassford resigned as chief observer about that time to join the Marines. We were all concerned. Our fears were well-founded, for trouble began from the day he left things went from bad to worse. The post was more unmanned than manned, and we were ashamed. Some people began to howl, too far to go, too hard on tires. So in desperation, the post was moved again. Mrs. Eyre donated a cabin about a mile from town. That cabin was desperately cold. Oh. Look, I'm not going to come here and freeze, get sick, and... Well, after tonight, I'm through coming here. Somebody else can be this sucker. Yeah? Well, this is my last night, too. Fella doesn't want to get sick. People quit one by one. Finally, as a last resort, we moved again right into town. Another move. It was a miserable one-room shack. We burned every shelf and movable board trying to keep warm. Some observers wrapped themselves at night in the curtains. There were mice, rats, bugs, and fleas. Fleas that nearly drove us crazy. Several nights, the post sat dark. In the daytime, a few old faithfuls kept up a pretense. It was time to quit bluffing. 
it came time to ask for help. Right at the critical time, you, Jim Franks, and Captain Bill Drogi of the San Diego filter area arrived. Into your ears, we poured our tale of woe. We want to keep our post running. Well, that's the spirit. That is just about impossible. There's only a handful of us left. Folks, I just heard that your old chief observer, Harvey Basford, is back in town. Mm. See, Harvey did just get back. The Marines gave him a medical discharge. Now, look. When Harvey was chief observer of Julian Post, he made things jump. How'd you like to have Harvey Basford back as your chief again? Oh, sure. Oh, well, that'd that'd be wonderful. wonderful. Well, Captain Drogi. Uh, yes? It, uh, it is important that we keep the Julian Post operating, isn't it? Oh, if you only knew how important it is. If everybody in your town could understand that, they'd all help. But I'll tell you something. You know what's wrong with this post, folks? What, mm-hmm. Captain? You need a good building. You've put up with enough discomforts. If you had a comfortable post building, I think most of your troubles would be over. Oh, yeah? Where are we going to get such a building? Well, here? we're going to work on it. Get organized. Get new recruits. And most important, get your old chief observer, Harvey Basford, back on the job. He'll make people go to work. Yeah, we'll make Harvey take over again. Harvey Basford, with his personality and his ability to organize, resumed his old task as chief observer of Julian Post. With the help of the American Legion and the people of our town, we built our present wonderful post building. We're high on a mountain, 4,300 feet up. And we can see and hear planes, and we report them to the Army, too. Our post is well manned, and the spirit is swell. Well, Jim, I didn't think I could write an article. Maybe I haven't. At least I've told you a lot about it. I haven't told all I know, but I think the rest is better left unmentioned. If there's anything else you'd like to know about the Julian Post, of which we're all pretty proud these days, just let me know. As ever, Mary. Such was the letter Mary Broadfleur wrote. A beautiful letter, a record of the strife, the sacrifices, the wholehearted desire of an American community to see a tough job through to a successful end. So hats off to the people who man the observation post of the interesting little Southern California mountain town of Julian. Each week, we present the National Broadcasting Company's Handsome Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award to some outstanding observation post or filter center. Here is Captain Joseph E. Drogi, who is now Ground Observation Officer of the West Los Angeles Filter Area, to make this week's presentation. Captain Drogi. The spirit of the American people cannot be daunted by obstacles. The people of this nation are determined to protect their nation. Small towns like Julian, California are a link in the great army system of protection. The people of that community have proved their courage, fortitude, and willingness. Today, the Julian Post operates with efficiency. To the Julian Post, we proudly present this week's Eyes Aloft Gold Trophy Award. This is Jane Whitman saying goodnight to the 150,000 Valiant Aircraft Warning Service volunteer civilians who keep constant vigil of our home front so that America will be ever safe from enemy attacks by air. Good night. Don't forget to send in your 100-word entry to the Why Do I Come Here contest. Perhaps you can win a prize. And if you want a free mimeographed copy of The Recognition, send your request to Eyes Aloft, Hollywood, California. Eyes Aloft is written and produced by Robert L. Redd. The music is composed and directed by Gordon Jenkins. This is Ken Carpenter charging you to always remember Eyes the Law. Eyes the Law. Watch in the sky. Watch for planes flying the lanes up above. Eyes the Law. Always on guard. This program comes to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.